societies. Like, we know what's the problem, capitalist modernity, but each of our culture has its own way to step out, and so on and so on. Against such an approach, we should totally defend European universalist legacy. How? Ha ha. Now comes the problem, the most probably problematic part. Uh, I will take an example uh, of the point that I'm trying to make. What does it mean, the ambiguity of colonization and European universalism? By reporting to you on an incident that happened to me, not even incident in India when I was there. Uh, uh, in a debate, an Indian cultural theorist complained that against me that I am in a privileged situation there, because he claimed it's easy for me to speak English, but am I aware of what uh, an a priori formal oppression or language colonization is the very fact that for them to debate with me, they have to use the very language of colonization, English, to formulate their very program of decolonization. Okay, so the idea was that the English language means that already formally in their very fight against colonization, they are colonized. I exploded, as you can imagine. First, I made an obvious remark, which was very well received, of typical big nation racism. Fuck him, my language is not English, you know. <laughs> like, since I come from small city, Slovene nation, it's okay for me to, talk, to speak English, no? <laughs> but they, big nation, they have the dignity of whatever. But my serious answer was much more problematic for them. I claim that what this guy didn't see is how, and be very careful here, this is the Hegelian point. This imposition of English, a foreign language, created the very X which is oppressed by it. Because what is oppressed, what they feel Indian emancipatory fighters as being oppressed, is not the actual pre-colonial India, but the authentic dream of a new universalist democratic India. So you see my point. I totally agreed with them that they experience English language as imposed. That the fact of being compelled to speak, to, to debate in English, means that they are deprived of something. But my point was here a much more vicious one. It was that that what they feel deprived of emerged only through this loss itself by them being forced to speak English. It's not the actual pre-modern India, which was just a kind of a oppressive, plural, inconsistent society, and so on and so on. You see the nice paradox that, uh, which is why, incidentally, this is how I explain of how the great intention of British colonizers there was not we must civilize Indians, we must impose of them our values. No, from the beginning they were not so stupid, but in an evil sense they were not stupid, the British. They knew very well that to control Indians they must keep them apart. They precisely want them to stick to their own original culture. If there was no original culture, they even created it. My friends in India gave me, I quote it in, I think, in uh, uh, the uh, Living in the End Times, the first chapter, you know, the book of Manu. It's the great classical text, the Bible of Indian traditional uh, 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 Hindu uh, social thought. It justifies uh, castes, de describes in detail the duties, rules, and so on. Nice, but you know what's the paradox? This book didn't exist before 18th century. There were just different fragments here, there. It was put together by British colonizers to have a kind of a unique ideological body to apply it to, uh, to, to apply it to, to, uh, to apply it to Indians. So again, what I'm claiming here 
is dead. And you know who knew this? There is another guy who is a tough guy, but he is my hero. Uh, Malcolm X. That's what his X means, Malcolm X. It's not simply we blacks were deprived of our uh, original roots, we just have an X. For him, I read him, I'm not bluffing, not totally. X was precisely X of an opening, creative opening. His idea was not just we blacks are oppressed, but precisely because we are, were torn from our original constellation, whatever, and precisely because we are more without roots than the whites, we have a unique chance of becoming more universal, emancipated than the whites. Which is why, it may be problematic, choice, but I admit it, which is why, as you all know, at the end, Malcolm X's solution was not some stupid black roots, but Islam. Precisely, in his view, Islam is a radically universal religion. And, uh, uh, or to put it in yet another way, more refined, even psychologically. Uh, you know, I developed this in my Big Fat Hegel book, you know this Lacan's idea that not only uh, uh, language is the house of being, not only we dwell in language, but that language is at the same time a torture house that we are never at home in language. That's the basic lesson of psychoanalysis called symbolic castration, whatever the bullshit, that there is a fundamental gap in balance between being human and language. There is always goes, something goes wrong. The problem with this Indian vision is that by locating this imbalance into, in, into colonial language, you obfuscate the fact that, like, Okay, you are tortured by English language, but where is the torturing done to you by your own local previous language? In other words, the most oppressive thing that could have happened to Indians is some kind of false liberation when someone would have told him, okay, let's get rid of English, let's, let's return to your primordial, whatever this was, culture. You know what, how would this liberation look? Warning to those who are sensitive, now comes a really dirty story. A joke about Jesus Christ, which was told to me, I love them, by a Palestinian Christian in Ramallah when I was there. <laughs> the joke is this one, it's vulgar. Not even a good joke, but I like the logic. Uh, the last evening before crucifixion, you know, Christ was there praying in the tent and so on, and of course he was God, and he's, they all knew this is his last day in peace, no? So the apostles are worried, you know, like, oh my God, our, our Lord did such great things when he didn't have any fun in his life, you know, so let's organize some fun of him. So they called Mary Magdalene, no, and says, would you go in and seduce, so that at least the last night he will have some fun, you know. <laughs> okay, being who she is, no, she said, oh, gladly, no, and <laughs> went in after five minutes, in a totally, with totally horrified cry, she ran out. And they asked her, no, don't worry, Christ is a good guy. He didn't rape her or what, much worse. Uh, uh, she asked her what went wrong. And she said, first, everything was OK. I danced a little bit before our Lord. Then I pulled out my skirt. I spread widely my legs. And he looked interesting. And then, and then Christ looked closely at my vagina. And he said, Oh, what a terrible wound, and put a hand on it and closed it totally, you know. Like, something like that would have been, I think, returned to pre-colonial origins, you know. The whole point is that, how should I put it, uh, to, to admit the wound, to fully identify with it. Like, for me, again, uh, the true victory over colonialism is not, re let's return to some primitive local culture. But it's too, what is already happening, this is why I have nothing against English language. Intelligent American conservatives already knew it. Okay, English language is winning today. But if you look at it closely, it's no longer American or British English. It's English whose model speakers are probably some kind of a half illiterate in English literature, Singapore merchants or whatever. 
or Greeks who will ruin all us, Europe, with their laziness. But that's another story. Sorry. No, but uh, uh, what has all, now I will conclude quickly, but what has all to do with uh, Hegel? Ma, I'm so sorry I don't have time to do it because, you know, I'm getting tired of politics. It may surprise you. I am now in the middle, even already finishing, a big new book on Hegel which will not be as long as the other one. It will have just six, 700 pages. And there now. And I focus precisely on this, how the Hegelian dialectical process is not this type of, from some immediate unity, you have split, and then magically synthesis again. No. At the beginning is the fall for Hegel. The good example would be this Indian example. You have a pre-colonial situation. We shouldn't demonize it. Maybe it was worse, maybe it was better. The problem is just that it was something, as it were, totally different. And also, we should not forget, there was nothing immediate, substantial about it. It had its own... And the problem is then, something new happens, like British colonization, and something is lost. But what is lost? is not what was actually lost. What is lost is retroactively created through this very loss. And if you think I'm dreaming here, that's the whole point, for example, of Hegel of his re in his reading of Christianity. He says it openly, that uh, paradise is simply stupid animal kingdom. That loss, uh, fall comes first. Fall itself creates what it is the fall from that dimension. So again, for Hegel, overcoming the fall does not mean you somehow squeeze back to purity. It means that you fully immerse yourself into the fall, and as it were, you see the liberating potential of the fall itself. Uh, or uh, Which is why, again, you should be very cautious about this logic of, you know, Hegel, beginning, then things go wrong, then magically they come together. First thing, don't go wrong. They are wrong for, from the very beginning, as 